Good day, everyone. My name is Lynn Huynh. I am the founder and host of Fan to Fame. We're here for a special athlete who had a standout career at Villanova playing football and despite being undrafted, spent eight seasons in the NFL. Please help me in welcoming former NFL star Darrell Young. How you doing, Darrell? All is well, Lynn. Appreciate you, man. Thank you for the platform today. Definitely, man. Huge. Uh, I grew up being a huge Redskins fan. Now the Washington football fan. So definitely <laughs> watching growing up. You were a touchdown machine. So uh, it's crazy to see us connecting now. But again, appreciate your time and look forward to having you share some of your experience and definitely some advice that you would share for the youth trying to follow your footsteps. So thanks again. No, I appreciate you. And uh, it always feels good to give back part of the social responsibility aspect of being an athlete. So absolutely. <laughs> Well, hey, you grew up in uh, Amityville, New York, from my understanding. And honestly, the only thing I know about New York, and you probably hear this all the time, you're smirking right now, is the movie, <laughs> which I was a huge fan about. But how did you get into football? You know what, man? I uh, So football was something that, you know, I, it's funny because I looked at it and I was like, I want to do that. So I remember it was 1994, used to sign up at the library down in the village and I was walking, I told my dad, hey, I wanna play football. So he's like, all right, let's go sign up. So I got to the library. So before I walked in, my parents both turned around and looked at me and said, you sure you wanna do this? And I was like, yeah, how hard can it be? I wanted to quit the first day, still don't like running to this day, but <laughs> glad I continued to do that because, uh, you know, it really set up the foundation of where I'm looking to go with, you know, in my life in terms of uh, just that structure from time management uh, and all those other things, all those transferable skills that you learn as an athlete. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think um, sports, I, when I have kids one day, I definitely want to have, put them in sports. I think want to keep them active to go have all that energy. And then too, there's so much things you learn that even for now, it translates to what I do at work and gives me yep. patience, hard work and just dedication to setting goals. So definitely yeah. hear you on that. Yes, sir. <laughs> I don't think many people know this, and um, but you're actually recruited to go to Villanova as a running back. However, you've converted to a linebacker can you yeah. talk about how that transition was? And do you think that things would have played out differently? Would you have chosen maybe a different program or system if you would have known that prior? Yeah, so great question. Uh, short answer to it is I didn't have a choice when I got to Villanova. So they moved me to defense. And uh, I, th I thought I was a hell of a running back, but they seen something different that a lot of guys convert to linebackers. So they said, hey, you know, I was fortunate enough to win a linebacker award in high school. So it wasn't like I was foreign to me. I played both. But uh, they said you're a better defensive player than offensive. Of course, you know, I rebuted that at first. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that. But um, fast forwarding, that system wouldn't have allowed me to play in the NFL at the level that I did because they didn't use a fullback one. And two, it was a spread system. So running backs that we had, Mo Gibson is from D.C. He trains uh, Chase Young now. Uh, we had a few other guys from Kentucky and DeKeith May. Uh, we had a thousand yard backs while I was there. So I wouldn't have touched the ball. I would have been blocking like I have, but the system wasn't allowed because it was a passing system mm -hmm. first. Then the transition, um, like I said, it wasn't hard. It was harder when I got to the NFL and I know we'll transition to that, but it was harder because on defense, you learn cover two, tight wings, right. cover two, that's the play. Versus when you, when I came to the Redskins, it was, Hey, we're going to go strong, right? three jet X bingo, Y crawl, whatever it may be. You only told the X and the tight end what to do. So everything else is a concept. And that was foreign to me. So I knew I had to, I had to hook and curl and cover two. <laughs> now you're telling me I have to flat, but I have protection, but I also have to cover the back. You know what I mean? So it was just right. different variations of it, but it was, it was great. And uh, like I said, it's one of the things and we talk about transferable skills that applies to the, the workspace now, adaptability. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely. So what, when I hear about that and I've been in, in positions when I was playing growing up where they try to move you around and some people don't take it the right way. They're like, Hey, this is what I want to do. This is my position. I'm not going to take that route. So what would what advice would you give to so like a kid or someone that's growing up that's being asked to move position? What would, advice would you share with, for that individual? Uh, do what's best for the team because it's we, not me. It's Sean McVay philosophy. And mm -hmm. Everything that you do now is going to be part of a, you're going to be part of a team and what you do, unless you're an entrepreneur, but you still need to rely on people to do their job in order to accomplish yours. So it was just do what's best for the team, but also put yourself in a situation where, you know, one of the things is uh, for you, you sports is character development. Right. So that stays with you. However you were raised up when you're seven years old is going to show up when you're 13 on the field. So make sure that, you know, you're practicing good habits and listening, you know, which is a key value. And yep. one of the things I always say is, you know, I'll, I'll ask you this, Lynn, give me a word that spells, uh, spells 
uh, listen with the same, what word spells listen with the same letters? I don't want to waste your time on that. <laughs> silent, silent. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, you, gotta yeah. Ask, you gotta be able to ask questions, sit back, understand it, be a sponge, and then go you know, perform on the field. So if you're silent, you'll be able to listen. You like can't that. have the answers. That's a good advice. I think a lot of times, especially when you're young growing up, um, especially if you're one of the top athletes, you think you're the best, you don't want to listen to anyone. But um, as time goes, you kind of reflect and see why people say certain things, why they push you. And it's only for the best. Um, I think everyone does their own individual things, things come together as a team. But again, it, it starts with a team because um, you can only go so far by yourself. So I think just to chime in there too, I think one of the common things that I see now from working with youth athletes is they don't ever want to, I don't want to say they, but I'll just use myself as an example. Being a young athlete right now at my age, mm -hmm. I never wanted to be in a room where players were better than me. I wanted to be the best. Right. Realizing that that's going to make you rise to the competition and only make you a better player as opposed to playing in a league that you're going to dominate and everyone expects you to dominate. No, that's a good point. I think a lot of people have eye openers when they leave from high school, going to college, or even from college to, to pros. So uh, you definitely see that. So definitely a good point. Um, if you ha would have known, and if you're going to go play linebacker, what school would you have picked if you could right. pick any school? I mean, Alabama produces them. Penn State was producing them at the time with LeVar Arrington, Sean Lee, and those guys. Ohio yeah. State was producing them with A.J. Hawk and, you know, some of the other guys. USC had Brian Cushion from Jersey, Clay Matthews. So you look at the, you know, those those institutions who produced the top linebackers that came out. I mean, Aaron Curry went to Wake Forest that year, and he got drafted number five overall the year I came out. So, um, I mean, honestly – with the way social media is now, I'd go anywhere. I'd play Mount <laughs> Union. I'd play Mount Union because they're getting the right. recognition. They're playing on ESPN. Social media huddle is giving you like we were popping in tapes and hitting play and record, you know, and <laughs> like that. So uh, it's just a different different atmosphere now. But I, I I would go anywhere honestly. I think uh you know you see you see uh, a perfect example is Brandon Staley being a defense you know a D three head coach and then becoming the Rams defensive coordinator and now he's the head coach of the Los Angeles Chargers. So they'll find you. They'll find talent now. Yeah, that's a good point. I think nowadays with social media and a lot of folks that I spoke to in the past um, interview, they said the same things. They, hey, when I played back in the day, people actually had to come to the game. You couldn't, you didn't have social media yeah. where you could just reach out to coaches, tweet them or ping them on Instagram. So you're right. Everyone's very accessible um, to just social media. And that's really opened up a lot of things. Gosh, so definitely hear on that. Get, man. Change. I mean, this right here. Like exactly. Being able to be reached, the accessibility. I mean, that's... That's where we're going. And I would tell kids too, just the last point there before I shut up, but is really think about, instead of thinking about today, think about the future, the uh, division in the future. Think about where you want to be in five years, but also the tactical approach of how you'll get there because everything on the field between, you know, uh, by goal strategies and KPIs, which is key performance indicators, mm -hmm do that on the field. My goal was to go out there and win the game. My strategy on how I do is win play by play. We're going to win these play individually. We throw the ball where it's supposed to. So it's a transferable skill that just isn't communicated that way. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of transferable um, things in sports that definitely carries on in anyone's life as from a youth to as adult. So definitely hear you on that. Uh, fast forward to the professional. Similar situation, but kind of reversal in regards to what position you play. So you were undrafted, went to the Redskins, uh, but again, you're at a linebacker in college. However, when you came to the Redskins, you narrow a fullback. So very kind of similar to what you were coming into college as a running back. So what, how, how did that all come about? Was that something that Coach Shanahan approached you and say, hey, we think you're a better fit for this? Is that something that you kind of approached the team? And uh, what was your thoughts when that happened? Was it like, oh, here, here it goes again? Um, how did that work out? I was, I was pissed off. People don't know. I actually went to the Redskins as a linebacker my first year. Yeah, I was yeah. That's why I got released, came back, worked at finish line for a couple of months um, and came back. And the day we were coming back, I'll never forget. And this just shows the power of influence. The linebacker coach was new, but the guy that was there the year before was now um, the assistant linebacker coach. I walked in, the linebacker coach said, who the hell are you? And I was like, you can't just show up. Like you have to have a contract. And you know, the uh, guy that's the assistant now said, hey, D.Y., just go over there. You'll play the weak side linebacker. I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. So fast forward, I'm pissed off now. I'm mad. We go in the weight room. So everyone knows if a scout comes down the stairs and taps you, that means you're cut. 
So the scout did that. And I'm like, oh, here we go with this BS, man. So he was like, hey, Mike Shanahan wants to see you. And I was like, that's different because usually you go see the GM and the trainers and watch your paperwork. So I walked into Shanahan's office. He says, you know, how's it going? And I said, man, this is BS. I'm sweating now. Like, I don't understand, like, how you guys are switching me. Like, tell me something good. And then long story short, he's, he let me go. And he's smiling. I'm like, man, what the hell is so funny? <laughs> he's like, I just want to know if you want to switch to fullback. Like, we have 13 linebackers. We have one fullback. You're not going to make this team as a linebacker because we're going to draft two more. So balls in your court. And I was like, well, that was easy. I don't even know we're talking. You could have just sent that message, you know, virtually. Could have texted right. me. Hey, it's all about me. transparency. Just let me know. Yeah. Just let me know. So yeah. the feeling at first was what the hell, but it wasn't foreign in a sense where I felt like I was an athlete, but at the mm -hmm. same time, it was one of the hardest things I ever did because it's foreign, foreign, foreign knowledge. I'm blocking for Clinton Portis. I'm backing right. up sellers. Larry Johnson and Willie Parker in the room. Like Larry Johnson was one of the best running backs to come out of Penn State and is 49 yards shy still today of the Kansas City Chiefs record. Willie Parker, you know, came off the Super Bowl run with the Steelers and did all those things. So I'm in the room with these guys and you're asking me to perform <laughs> and play right. at the highest level to block for these guys. So it was uh, it was nerve wracking, but fun. It was an opportunity. No, I definitely think you had a good mindset. It's just, hey, I'm the same way. Just keep me transparent, but I'm open to things. Just let me know what I need to do. But uh, just don't go around the bushes, right? That's that's my mentality as well. So nowadays, you know, it's only been a few years since you left the league and, uh, you know, hung up the cleats. But um, the game has changed a bit in the sense of the role of the fullback. Not many teams utilize a fullback as much as they did when you played. What's your thoughts on that? And do you think that will – kind of come again and come around where fullbacks will be utilized more in the future. Yeah, it's a copycat league because, you know, fullbacks, you see Lorenzo Neal, you see some of like, these are older guys, Howard Griffin blocking for Terrell Davis. So they were big then and mm -hmm. fullbacks kind of went away for a little bit. And then my era, they started to come back with Vonta Leach. Kyle Uzcheck was drafted. Uh, myself, you had Bruce Miller out in San Francisco. So each team had one and, um, it's a copycat league. So whatever worked last week when Sean McVay did it or Matt LaFleur or whoever won that game, you're going to see it the next week. So the fullback role is diminishing, but it will come back. Think about Peyton Manning and, you know, that that game where he needed a fullback on the one yard line. If he had a yeah. fullback, he scored. Um, you know, things, I, I don't want to say it like that. You know, things could have happened. But right. two years ago, there was a percentage that came out that said teams who have a fullback have better production in the running game. So I was excited about that. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. It, it's crazy because uh, when I used to watch you play, I was like, that's a big ass fullback. <laughs> like fullbacks are big, right? Yeah, exactly. But I was like, I honestly thought, you know, I was like, this guy's like a linebacker size. So it's crazy when I kind of did more research on you because I don't think many people knew that. And then I was like, all right, that kind of makes sense now. He started as a linebacker and became a fullback. But um, I was like, you are a big dude <laughs> and still are. So that I was that just running into people, sense. man. <laughs> Half of the years, I don't have any brain cells today, but it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> we get wiser through the, through the seconds and the days, man. Yeah, that's uh, it. So during your time there, you, uh, RG3 comes along, is uh, considered a superstar, not only within you know the organization, but also within the league. You guys made it to the playoffs that year. Uh, we kind of know what happened, transpired. I've always been a huge RG3 fan, even till now. Have his jersey back here, as you see. And I think it's actually his birthday, so... You know, I don't think he'll probably hear this, but, sh you know, shout out to RG3 and happy birthday. Appreciate everything you did. <laughs> yeah. How, how was that experience, like, uh, being in the locker room that whole year? Because it was a roller coaster year, right? It's uh, a lot of things happened. So, can you kind of walk through that? Man, it was uh, the, the worst, best year of my life. And I say worst because it started off, like, there was so much excitement around drafting him number two overall. Um, you know, we had Rex Grossman. They, then they draft Kirk Cousins. You're like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> you know what I mean? But then <laughs> – um we get into the season and we're at three and six and i never i will never forget this moment mike shanahan walks in the team room it's right before the bye week right there's i don't know about you guys i'm already planning for next year because this team doesn't want to win you guys don't feel you don't know how to win and we're looking to make changes we went on a seven game win streak after that when we came back from the bye week and said you know what my job is uh, important to me so i'm gonna go out there and perform but it was we actually jailed. They brought us closer together. And I don't know if that was reverse psychology or what he did. You know, I was going to say that. He was testing you guys. <laughs> but if you remember, the report said he was tanking on us. Like, he already came out and went to the media yeah. and said, we're going to look to next year and start rebuilding and get younger and, you know, focus on what we have and focus towards the future. And we went on a seven-game win streak playing Dallas in the stadium that night. I've never been a part of anything so special because the yeah. stadium 
and my whole literally my whole family was there you know, my brother was back from Afghanistan like it was just it was just amazing to be in that stadium that night and uh there was so many good people man so many good memories that's cool man yeah I'd, uh it was, that was probably so I was born in 1990 Jesus. and um you know we when you turn on television you know, the local channels, they'll show like the Daryl Green days, the Super Bowls in the 90s, 80s. And I'm like, that's great. Now, but I want to see something now. So honestly, that year was probably probably the most exciting year for me to watch as a, as a fan. Yep. So that's cool. And I appreciate you kind of sharing that story of uh, from this oh, side. Good times, man. Good times. It was, uh, we, did, we didn't believe at first, but then we won four. I'm like, all right. We, then RG3 got hurt, the Ravens game. Then we go into Cleveland. It's like, you know what? We might have a chance or something, man. We won and I'm like, oh, we're playing Seattle. Then I just remember I have an image of Russell Wilson picking up the ball in one hand when he fumbled. And yeah. I, knew that was, I knew that was the turning point in the game. I knew that was the turning point. Um, in regards to RG3, I think a lot of people, especially as a fan, um, you know, the media kind of says a lot of things. Honestly, I'm the type that I kind of try to block some of those out as a fan. But what's something about RG3 that people don't know about? And, um, you know, what, what's some fond memories you had playing with him and just that, that awesome, like, up and down year? What's something um, – can you share a story with us? Yeah, so he's uh, – man, RG3 is one of those guys that was just misunderstood. You know, being a 22-year-old, people uh, literally looked at him as a savior, which he was. He was a hero yeah. for seven weeks on one leg. You know, like, you can't look back and say he shouldn't have played and – did other things, but uh, he's he's one of the guys that uh, he's a leader naturally. He doesn't have to really say much, but when you walk in, you know he's in there. And it's like, he almost demands that he's either playing his music, he's chilling, but he's friendly and people don't understand that. Like he wasn't a bad guy, he was yeah. approachable, but he was a guy at 22 when, and I used the example, him and Obama in one place, and people flocked to RG3. And I'm like, that's right. the president and this is RG3, damn. Like this right. dude, clout, you know what I mean? <laughs> It was, it was one of those surreal moments, like, wow, like, this is when sports is really bigger than anything else. And that's right. when you get the power of sports within the community. No, definitely. He definitely had that superstar stature. There was a lot of hopes. And honestly, to this day, I have so much respect for him. So it, that's, that's cool to hear. I'm glad you kind of cleared that up for a lot of people that might have the different perception just based on what they hear and see. He's the man. No, nothing ever bad to say about him, man. He's good, real good people. Humble. Um, just like electrifying in so many ways. Yeah. I and mean, people don't know the dude was, I don't want to say he might've been a better track runner because he was, he's a Heisman winner, but right. he ran a 46 and in yeah. year, that's ridiculous. Like yeah. that doesn't happen. <laughs> You're talking about a 400 and this dude's running 45 and 46. That's, yeah. that's, that's crazy. Yeah. That's so crazy. Times. That mean, and he ran like a 44 and nine, I think in the open four. So you're telling me the hurdles, you're only two sec, two ten, two seconds slower. <laughs> in, in an open four so if i'm questioning his win when he's running the open or that dude's just a different monster he's definitely uh he's definitely athlete for sure Absolutely. i have to ask this question man what do you think about the name change from the redskins to watching football team and uh what name would you like it to be in the future because that's still you know rumbling around yeah you know what if it, if it offended people you know i'm okay with it you know right. i uh, at first, you know, people have asked me this over the years and I just said, hey, let's do what's best for the community. Right. Like that, that was, you know, bothering a lot of people and let's change it. Let's make sure that we're still, you know, serving and doing our due diligence as professional athletes to make sure that, you know, we're providing a platform in order, you know, just to play in, you know, things of that nature. But I don't have a problem with the name, the name change. And what would I like it to be? Uh, one of the things I threw out there, like I'm not saying call it hogs, but how can you pay homage to the guys that people really understand? And I don't know right. what that room looks like, you know what I mean? But um, I think they'll come up with the branding element of it and, and be good. But hey, if Washington football seems fine. They made the playoffs like that. So don't change what ain't <laughs> <laughs> No, that's how I see that. Um, and one thing I'm thinking about too is I'm going to start buying some purchases, uh, some items, because it's going to be a couple years down the road. It's going to be worth a lot of money. And uh, mm -hmm. it kind of grew on me, right? I think it's a temporary name, but definitely grew on me. And yes, yeah, yeah. working so far. So we shall people see. Even, people aren't even talking about it anymore. You see how it happens when you win? When you win, exactly. So, you win. Exceptional things. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> Reflecting back in uh, your career, and you didn't only just spend time with the Redskins, right? You, you spent time, I think, with the Panthers a little bit and the Bears. But um, when you flip back in your career, what's something that pops out the most, like one of the most, mo most memorable experience that you went through? You know what? Uh, being cut was the hardest thing in my life. And I advise younger athletes, if you're listening, to find a craft. 
like something that you're good at, good at outside of sports. And I started DJing. Am I good? Hell no. I have fun. Like it's something that takes my mind and it's like, that's my coping mechanism. Right. I have my, I have my daughter, like that's another way. So whatever it is that you can do to separate from the sports. So you're an athlete and, and not just identify it with just being an athlete. I think you need to do that from an early age. And that's one of the things I didn't do. So looking back on that, I wish I would have did that, but memorable too. Uh, the network in the locker room, like you don't get that anywhere. Like you can't walk anywhere in sweats and Uggs and fit in and be at work. That just right. doesn't happen unless you're your own businessman. And still you have to go do sales and other things. So you have to put on a suit and things like that. So I think, uh, you know, just the power of networking, just to throw a nugget in there. It's not about what you know. It's not about who you know. It's about who knows you. Right. No, that's a good advice. I think that's in, uh, in everyday life. It doesn't matter what type of business you're in, whether it be sports, in the business world, restaurants. It's all about knowing people, but how do you connect with them, right? And um, I think social media is a great way. So definitely hear you on that. What well, communicates, but few connect. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Good book. <laughs> but what advice would you give to like a youth that's trying to get a scholarship to play college football? And then part two of it, um, someone that's in college trying to make it to the NFL. Yeah, so the first part to that, I like to write down to make sure I hit stuff. So the first part is it refer to yourself as a student athlete. So when you go in, it's like, here's the value add that I can bring to your institution. People respond to vision and people want to understand the why. So if, you know, I'm putting it out there, what you want to do in legacy wise, be a student athlete. And then the second piece to it, uh, advice that I would give a college student trying to make it to the pros. If you're going to be all in, be all in because the average lifespan is three and a half years. People think it's glorious and glamorous. They see the cars, they see the watches, they see Odell wearing a however many thousand dollar watch on Monday night football. That's great. But less than 1% of the players who actually play the game never have to work again. Yeah. So I would probably say maybe maybe two or 3%. We'll leave it at that, being the quarterbacks and you, know, you get some linemen who make some really good money. But the majority of the guys like myself make minimum every year and you have to live for the rest of your life. So imagine, being 26 year old, 26 years old, and people are telling you, well, they never really actually tell you that you're done. So it's right. always that factor of, damn, what do I do next? I don't know what I'm good at. So start building out what you want your future to look like. And it's not necessarily, you need to hone in on this, but know that if you wanna be a CEO, you wanna get into real estate, what credentials do I need to get into that space? How do I do it? Who are the people that can assist me in getting there? So. That, that's the advice that I would have. Network your ass off because yeah, the day man, when you're done, when you're done being a professional athlete, that phone doesn't ring anymore. Yeah, or as much I'll say that as much. Yeah, but like you said, as long as you kind of plan ahead and have goals in mind, and just know that hey, yeah, the lifespan. Just be realistic for yourself. It's not going to be forever. Um, not you, for long. It's not going <laughs> to be for long. So what's the plan B of it? But I think yeah. you know when you're in the NFL, that's a great opportunity to network right there. Um, you're going to meet people not only within the business, but there's going to be people like fans like myself that's going to gravitate to you. That you, can, you never know if someone has a business they want to partner up with in the future. So yeah. um, that's something I would think about if I was in that position. Um, Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. It's a, it's a process, man. It's a process. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's uh, There's always different chapters in life. Um, some fun facts. Uh, were you a New York Giants fan growing up, being from New York, or who did you root for? And who was a role model that you looked up to? Yeah, so I had uh, I liked the Giants and the Jets, but I would always pick the Giants. Even though I'm from Long Island, I'm supposed to be a Jets fan. Mm. Role model-wise, it's weird because I never looked at celebrities as role models. Yeah. Um, in my own household because I looked at what my dad did from a grinding standpoint, like driving an ambulance and cleaning banks at night to make sure that I never had to ask for anything. And I didn't know the struggle that he went through. I didn't know half of the conversations that were being had because they told me to focus on school and sports and where you want to go with this. Go get a scholarship, have fun. Anything that comes after that will be a blessing. But then also my brother, you know, a lot of people um, would say like, how do you not have someone that's an influencer? Well, he is an influencer. He served in the military for me. My job was to entertain 90,000 people. His job was to go save my life so I can entertain people. So being, you know, sacrificing what he did, going to Afghanistan, doing different tours, like everything that he went through, he's, those two guys are my heroes and the leaders in my life. And, you know, and he's actually FaceTiming me right now. How ironic, <laughs> his ears must be <laughs> Um But yeah, those two guys, man, they, uh, 
they really shaped up who I want to be as a man. I'm not saying I'm, I'm there yet. It's right. Who I want to be as a man. No, that's cool. I, I definitely hear you on that. I um, Someone I look up to is definitely my parents, too. They came from Vietnam. And after the Vietnam War, they went through the struggle. I was first generation. So, yeah, there's definitely people like you that I really enjoyed watching when I was playing sports. I was like, I want to be like them. But when it came to, like, personal life, the people I can, you know, refer to the most is my parents. I saw what they did day in and day out. And as I got older, and I'm actually going to see them later today, you know, it's, it makes me realize how bad of a kid I was back then and how I want to give back even more to them. Oh, so I kind of mentioned about how what I perceive of Amityville. I know about a movie. Um, I have to ask you that. Did, did you watch the movie? And like, what was the, pers like, what is the, uh, the feeling in the town? Is that like a big deal? Is it kind of like you got to, uh, tired of hearing about it? Um, so what's your, how do you perceive it? <laughs> it? It was a good thing. At first you're like, what is, what's the hype about this thing? But then you start to understand the meaning behind it and what really happened. And yeah. it actually ended up being a good thing for me because LeVar Arrington referred to me as the Amityville horror. And, <laughs> and, says it, and it's like, okay, it goes viral for a little bit. So I would be walking and people are like, oh, it's the Amityville horror. And I'm like, oh, I appreciate that. You guys I didn't know hear about oh. that one. I like yeah. that though. <laughs> so just, you know, things like that. Um, but it was never annoying. Anytime people say that, you know, you don't want to sign autographs and do all of that. Well, I was the opposite because when people stop asking me for anything, I'm like, oh man, I used to be that guy. That, <laughs> I'm still, man. That's so, true. Yeah. You miss it. You miss it. No, that's definitely true. It's uh, things like that. It, it means a lot to a lot of people. And you're right. It's like how I feel. If my parents or my boss, if someone stops getting on me, there's an issue with it. They stop believing in me. That's how I feel. So yeah. definitely agree with you. You mentioned yeah. a few players. You know, we talked a little bit about RG3. You talked about LeVar Arrington. Uh, was there anyone within the uh, the league when you played that you kind of looked up to or reached out to for advice, whether Man. it be current or alumni? That's a good question. Uh, Santana Moss was probably my favorite player in, uh, ever, just being with the Redskins. I had different guys, different places. But Santana was one of those guys that how can you be so real but get their support because I've always seen it backwards. Like yeah. real people are like, oh, this dude's an a-hole, but it wasn't. He was just, it's a Miami thing. I don't know what it is, but his persona, <laughs> he was a leader in so many ways. And when he spoke, that meant that meant something because he was one of those quiet guys that kind of sat back, observed, never really said much, but when he did, it was powerful. And then London Fletcher, those two yeah. guys, because I'd never seen a guy that, like he'd stop in the middle of practice and be like, oh man, they're going this way. Like that's the same play. And it's like, how do you do that? Like, how do you know that? Like, what what are you doing in your free time that you know every play that we're running? Like you had to see the script. And he was like, no, just tendencies, you know, things like that. So you pick up those little things. And then when I got to Carolina, Luke Keekley might have been one of my favorite people players ever. Okay. Like I've never met a guy that would not like a good out. dude. Yeah. I never met a guy that would knock you out and help you up, smile, <laughs> have a conversation with you. Line up the next point and then do it again. I've never seen that in my life. And uh, he's just a hell of a dude, man. Hell of a dude, hell of a player. And he should be a first battle Hall of Famer. I think he will be. I definitely think he will be. He no, those be. are some great names. Santana Moss. I have a jersey, too. And I actually got an autograph from here. I, I met him and Clint Ports, a few of the guys. Yeah, definitely something about the U, right? They have that different swagger on them. But he was definitely one of my favorites. Yeah. Um Luke Cooley was a be is a beast. It's crazy to think he, yeah, he's retired. Uh, I felt like he had more years to go, but hey, um, yeah. everyone's different paths and different aspirations. So nothing hate about that. No, um, you know, with the Super Bowl that just ended, I've never been, again, I'm a, I'm a big Washington football team fan, big Redskins fan. Never really hate on Brady though. I don't know what your thoughts are on him. My thing is like, hey, he was an underdog coming in. He was a six rounder, I think. He's not the most athletic guy in the world. People thought that he was based on the system, but once he leaves, he's not going to do anything. Wins the Super Bowl, first year of Tampa Bay, but there's definitely more than it was just him. But I think what he brought to the table is confidence. He brought that experience. And when he saw all these defense special teams, it made people believe, I felt like, and they did what they did. So what's, what was your thoughts on the Super Bowl? And what's your thoughts on Tom Brady? And, um, you know, I think a lot of people think he's very arrogant and stuff, but I think there's a difference between arrogant and confidence. What's your, what was your thoughts on the Super Bowl? And what's your thoughts on Tom Brady? So if anyone knows me well, they know that uh, I never bet against Tom Brady. And <laughs> when I say bet, I work for the NFL, so I can't say bet. But yeah, yeah, I yeah. never root against Tom Brady in any facet. Tom Brady and Floyd May Mayweather, those are the two I never, I will never go against. Smart and man. I, I called it. So I actually won. You know, like, we just picked who our, who we think uh, Super Bowl predictions will be right. in the department. And I said in March, and we did this in August, 
they said, you know, who do you guys pick? And I said, the Super Bowl is going to be Kansas City versus Tampa Bay. And they're like, well, why do you think? And I said, do you think Tom Brady was going down there not to be the first player in NFL history to play in a Super Bowl, win in that Super Bowl, and probably walk out, which he may not. But that's going to happen. It's going to, the headline is going to be old versus new. And sure enough, they were like, are you some type of psychic? And I was like, no. Who? Why else would he go to Tampa Bay? Yeah. Like, there's no reason. Like, there's so many other teams in warm atmosphere that he could have went to. Jacksonville. Right. Like all these other places, and he chose Tampa Bay. Mm-hmm. You know? So I just, I just, I, I foresee it. I, I seen it. I foreshadowed it. And people were like, eh, "No, nah, I don't know." Tom Brady's old. I'm like, "Yeah, he was 11 and five each year when he was divisional runner up in terms of what he did." Right. Hey, stats. <laughs> stats don't lie. <laughs> stats don't lie. No, I think you and I are in the same boat in regards to that. I don't. I never root against him. I, uh, I love to see a good game, but I'm just like, I always think he's gonna come off top. I mean, it's hard not to. Do you think he's going to win another one? He said he's coming back. Do you think he's going to win another one before it's all said and done, as long as yeah, he stays that, healthy? Yeah, that roster that they have, they're young. I mean, Gronk, is, he's only, what, 32, 33? Yeah, so. they're still young, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Um, you got Gronk. You got Cameron Bray. O.J. Howard will be coming back, who they lost. You got Godwin. You got That's Mike. True. You got Antonio Brown, if he comes back with them. Leonard Fournette balled out on a one-year deal. I'm sure he'll come back to win yeah. another school and take a cut. Ronald Darby played well. Like, left tackle Donovan Smith he's from Amityville here so like I gotta support him but there's that team is stacked and then their defense who no one spoke about yeah probably was the MVP of the game yeah (laughs) you know and no one spoke about and they had some key guys missing so like Mm -hmm. what they're what they're gonna do and what Todd Bowles did is a hell of a job down there because no one spoke about absolutely and not only that I think um even players that's not on the roster now it's just like when you win you gravitate people right so i wouldn't be surprised if all these key names or these players that you want to think about is going to go there um mm-hmm. it's a place where if you want to win the super bowl they're going to have high hopes good weather and it's a team to kind of be with right now so i can see that happening any final words or advice for any youth that's you know trying to make it or even tips to rookies that's just about to join the nfl and what are some last minute things you would like to share uh read because you need to understand what you're getting into. So I didn't understand the powers of power of reading. And I thought my experiences would come from actual life experience and just doing things. So read, understand what you're going through. And then the last piece that I always say, and this is my favorite quote in life. And this is, I heard this from some mentees, which is great. I can't complain about having a lot on my plate when my goal was to eat. So whatever that roller coaster looks like, I'm going to make sure that I put myself in a situation where I'm going to be able to overcome any obstacles. That's something that I learned from sports. You deal with adversity, you deal with sudden change, you deal with the turnover. How are you going to respond to it? And not so much focus on the past, but let that be a key learning to say, you know, okay, I learned from that, but what am I going to do in the future to make sure either I don't make that mistake again, or I put myself in a situation to be successful. And then the last piece of it is you want to be able to, whatever situation you're doing is define success. What does success look like to you? How am I measuring it? And uh, yeah, that, that would be the last piece of it. Just how, how are you going to measure success and not saying I wish I would have, you know, when you look back on your life in a year. Mm-hmm. That's the worst thing is thinking could have, would have, should have. Uh, like you said, have a game plan. Just know, you know, the pros and cons of both. But more importantly, just do it. I think that's a lot of thing is that stops people. They they have all these great ideas, but they just don't do it because they're they're fearful of what's going to happen or what other people can perceive. But if it's something that you want to do and you're committed to it, you just got to do it. And from there, you can kind of navigate around it. So yep. I hear you 100. percent Well, hey, yeah, Darrell, I appreciate your time, man. I know you're busy. Just got done for your midterms. I know you got you're doing stuff with the league still. Um, so again, appreciate your time. It's a blessing to talk to you, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll get a chance to connect again t- sometime soon. No, I appreciate you, Eddie. Thank you for the platform today, man. And uh, it was good to hear a little bit about you. And uh, you know, I hope this flat platform takes off because it's good. It's good stuff.